Nickelodeon is all about animation. And animation is all about the future. It's true, with every stroke of a brush, scratch of a pencil, or etch of a pen, animators imagine a better world. So tonight, we're going to honor a group of emerging artists who represent the future of our industry in this special edition of Variety and Nickelodeon's 10 Animators to Watch. Here to introduce our show is Variety's Executive Vice President of Content, Steve Gatos. Hi, I'm Steve Gatos, Executive Vice President of Content at Variety. I'm so excited to welcome you to Variety's 10 Animators to Watch special presented by Nickelodeon. This is the sixth year that we've presented the Variety 10 Animators to Watch, and one of the pleasures is seeing these animators go on to direct and be involved in some of the biggest and most important animated projects that are enjoyed by audiences all over the world. In the past five years, we've had a fantastic live event. That's not happening this year. But thanks to Nickelodeon, we've created a special. Put this special together. We interviewed all 10 of our animators to watch, talk about the future of animation. We also have a Creative Impact in Animation Award to an amazing talent, Jorge Guterres. So now, I'd like to introduce the president of Nickelodeon Animation, Ramsey Nido. I want to give a big thanks to everyone at Variety for this great partnership on this event, which in essence celebrates animation. I also want to thank Brian Robbins, president of Viacom CBS Kids and Family, and my boss. Thank you for giving all of us the keys to the animation capital. So I started my career at Nickelodeon almost 20 years ago, and I've been back in this role for almost two years, and I'm so proud of what we've all been able to accomplish in a very short period of time. Let's face it, this year has been crazy, but our industry persevered with all of us working remotely every day. Everyone in this special is gonna be talking about the future because animation is the future. So let's raise a glass and get this party started. You're watching Nickelodeon and Variety's 10 Animators to Watch, Visions of Tomorrow. Only bound by the limits of their imagination, animators create new and wondrous worlds. They invite us into these fantastical places to explore and experience worlds of the future. Hi, my name is Amanda Lee. I'm currently art director at Nickelodeon Animation. One of the things I love most about animation is that you get to tell really relatable stories, but then put them in these fantastical worlds. And one of the things I really love about design is that you really get to build that world out. I feel like a lot of people do want to be character designers, but for me, I treat my worlds much like characters. I worked two years in architecture before I transitioned into animation, but the way I design is still very architecturally based. When I was working on Kung Fu Panda, some of the research I did was on very specific Asian architecture that included things like roof lines, doors, all the way down to the screens. My main source of inspiration is definitely from the real world. I really love camping, I love hiking, I love being out in the national parks. And when you're out there, you really realize how tiny you are in this world. Uh, it really gives me a lot of inspiration in my artwork. One of the things I really loved about Designing Tangled was that it was super illustrative and I got to really reference a lot of nature. I really loved working on Samurai Jack. One of the challenges was designing a language for that show in a way that it still felt believable and real to everybody else. There's an episode where Jack 
visits a robot junkyard. Um, in that episode, I referenced a lot of 80s robots for the designs. If I'm designing for these future worlds, I would love to see a world where nature and architecture can be fully integrated. This might include solar panels on the sides of buildings. If it was a skyscraper, maybe we have trees going up on the different levels and the plants are being integrated into the architecture. Ultimately, the goal here is to make sure that we're living in harmony with nature. Hi, I'm Mike Chillian, and I am the creator of Tig and Seek. Animation has a very unique way of satirizing the world. You hear that? It doesn't matter if the cartoons are fantastical or realistic. You're building a weird simulation where you can just project yourself into it. When I first moved to LA, I originally went to school for music, and eventually I started making short films for Channel 101. Channel 101 was where I met Justin Roiland, and then he eventually came to me with the Rick and Morty pilot, and I was like, all right, Justin, here's another one of your pilots. Let's see where this one goes. I remember Justin being very, very particular about the way he approached world building. For example, when we were designing the portal gun, I went through a bunch of different designs for that. All that stuff really matters. So in Teague and Seek, I was very specific with what I wanted the world to look like in the pilot. I wanted the show to feel like you were a kid in your dad's office. We skew the perspectives. You see a lot of the floor behind Tiggy, and it makes him feel younger and smaller. Genius, Gweeseek, genius. Gweeseek makes a lot of these weird gizmos in the show. I really wanted to make it feel like kids can make these things at home. Like she'll use a remote control or a lamp or like a bicycle wheel and put something really weird together. When you're animating, you create the simulations and they become so believable. I look forward to a future where things feel like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, where you can hang out with cartoon character friends all around you. That's the dream. I'm Ann Walker Farrell. I'm a director from such shows as Duncanville and Bojack Horseman. So one of the big reasons that I was drawn to animation initially was it, it was an escape. Cartoons, drawing, storytelling, it was all a way for me to create my own world. When you come in as a director for TV animation, you get a script. And it's like, okay, make this real, go. So Bojack, for example, is such a volatile, immature character that I wanted the inner voice in his head to be the equivalent of a five-year-old scribbling with cramps. Opportunities like this are really fun. So for Final Space, we were actually encouraged to come forward with ideas about the story, the world, character development. There was an episode where this character, Fox, is mortally wounded, and Kevin, who up until this point has been comic relief, gives a piece of himself to save Fox's life. It was such a sweet moment, and it went by lightning fast in the script. And so I created a montage of the flashbacks to Ash being you know, incredibly brave and strong and fearless, and Kevin looking on in awe. And it's that awe and that love that prompts him to give a piece of himself to save her brother. In between seasons of BoJack Horseman, I rediscovered a script that I wrote when I was about 17 called Star Seeking. I was reading it and I thought, I still love sci-fi. I love cyberpunk. You know, I'm a sucker for grim dystopian futures. Star Seeking is the story of a biometric engineer named Celeste. I came to realize that Star Seeking is a story about privilege. It's a story about somebody who lives in a world that has always worked for them. And she falls in with a resistance group. She learns a little bit more about the world. Change is inherently going to be uncomfortable. But at the same time, I hope as we continue to grow and change together, we remember that we're all human and we're in this together. This is a sketchbook of drawings from my uh, high school years. 
When I was a kid, I think I mostly just drew Pokemon. Yet more cats. A uh, novel written about my cat. So that's what a normal nine-year-old does, right? I used to draw next to my brother while he played video games. One of my first comic books that I drew was actually post-apocalyptic. It was nuts and very depressing. <laughs> I needed showing my artwork to anybody. I would hide it under my mattress in my bedroom. <laughs> Clearly, I'm uh, obsession with circuses and P.T. Barnum and their lifelong. Uh, please note the first place ribbon on this jewel. All she could see was a basket where she had been sleeping. Two plastic bowls. Two plastic bowls? Some of these are a little, uh, they're not kid friendly. Jeez Louise. Some of this has to get blurred out. All of the things that I drew were horses, dragons, monsters, aliens. Like any self-respecting young artist, I got obsessed with Dolly and surrealism. Okay. okay, all right, okay, I know, I know, it's your favorite book, hang on. Some things never change, you know? Here again is Variety's Executive Vice President of Content, Steve Gatos. The next group of animators that we're going to talk with are really utilizing animation art to make a better world where there's more inclusivity and they're bringing it to life through their animation. Each one of them in their own way, they're inspiring and creating hope for the future. Hi, I'm Amanda Dollywall. I'm a graphic novelist, director, and storyboard artist. The stories I tell aren't about making a perfect future, it's about making a nicer version of now. I graduated in 2011, and then I went to work at Nickelodeon as a storyboard revisionist. I stayed there to work on Robot Monster, Inky Malinky, Sean Jane Craig, and then eventually I decided to move over to Cartoon Network. Animation is a real team sport. Everyone has this specific role, and everyone's trying to make the creator's vision come to life. So you end up filtering yourself as you learn to think like someone else. So to even that out, I use comics and my personal work to just be purely me. In 2017, I went to the Women's March and there were so many signs everywhere saying the future is female. And I thought, hey, what if there was a world without men? And that was the start of Woman World. I didn't really have a vision for Woman World. I just had a couple comics as an idea. And then I was kind of as shocked as anyone when it took off and all these people were tagging their friends. It was a real confidence boost to see something I had made was resonating with people. It was similar back in 2018 when I started making Psychopedia Exotica. I thought I would make a comic about microaggressions and stuff I had experienced, but I kind of thought like, eh, the world's probably over that. And then this year ended up being the year of microaggressions and full-on aggressions. We end up experiencing so many of the same things again and again in our lifetime. Maybe a different circumstance, maybe a different person, and they're kind of timeless. I think the best projects and art comes from being uncomfortable, exploring those kind of sensitive topics. When you can tell stories about those things, they really resonate with people. Ultimately, I just make what I want to make. I am Tiffany Ford. I'm a cartoonist, illustrator, and animator. I'm always drawn to telling stories that other people would hopefully feel and find relatable. I think the best way to accomplish this is to tell a story that is close to you, that you understand. And if you understand this, then someone else will understand. And in the end, you'll have a connection. My grandparents are from the Philippines and they couldn't speak any English. So we would hang out and watch Disney movies together. Even though they couldn't understand, they still enjoyed it and were able to connect with those characters. It made me feel that it was really important to connect with a lot of different people at once. I would always hang out at the Oviatt Library at Cal State North Ridge with my friend, and we would draw and study all different kinds of art history books, art history of Korea, East and West Africa, Oceania, and others. And just looking at that stuff and seeing how it evolved had a really big impact on me. I like to make portraits of people who I see on the street who have impacted me in that moment and made me feel that love for them, and I like to honor them in my work. I'm really proud of our work on Craig of the Creek on Cartoon Network. 
Craig is a wonderful, beautiful black child who is free to play wherever he wants and gets to meet all these different kinds of kids who all have their own different stories. We did this episode called Craig and the Kids Table. This episode always meant a lot to me because it was a portrait of a family enjoying each other's company and it looked like my family. I didn't always get to see images like that growing up, so I was very proud to contribute to the population of those images for others to see. I do believe that animation can give hope for the future because you create something that gives you and others joy and that I think is worth pursuing. Hey, I'm John Travick. I'm a cartoonist, storyboard artist, and show creator. Growing up, I was always surrounded by art. My dad was a traditional sign painter, and he was a demolition derby driver, so we were always painting up these old cars. For me, Danger Mouse was a huge influence. And there was this Fleischer short called The Cobweb Hotel. So bouncy, it's a really sweet story too. I always wanted to draw cartoons and comics, but I just didn't know how. I grew up in a small town in Michigan. You either got a job in a factory or an auto plant. I used to think that the only way to be creative was to get high, because it took me down a dark path. I went to jail when I was 24, and after five different rehabs, just trying to get sober. So then fast forward four years into my sobriety, I'd gotten married, bought a house, finished trade school. It occurred to me that this isn't what I got sober for, and I got sober so I could chase my dreams. But when I got hired onto SpongeBob, I felt like I had this huge duty. I wanted to pass the baton to the next up-and-comers, and I wanted them to know that they could do it too. We go to children's hospitals, and it's just priceless to show them that you're a person that works on SpongeBob. When I was developing the Minimalist Post, I was learning how to be more loving and more compassionate to people. The story behind Parker J. Cloud is he used to rain on people's parades, and now he wants to brighten people's days. In that way, Parker is basically me. Parker isn't a boy or a girl. It's just a cloud. Hopefully, you can see yourself in the thing. I wanted to make a show that could uplift people during these hard times doing art and making things can bring people together so we can get through all of this. Yeah, so this is this is my home office. I do I do miss studio life. You know, I don't have coworkers now. I do, but they're four-legged and furry. Give notes for me. You know, a lot of times when I get stuck on a project, I'll often take a break, you know, taking my dog out for a hike. I think a lot of times when you're problem solving, it's better not to think specifically about the problem. Sorry, it's my dog. Louie. I make sure that I have my sketchbook with me wherever I go, and I try to keep, I try to draw as often as I can. Whenever I'm like watching a movie or something, I'll just be watching with like one eye and drawing with another. Bad habit, but uh, I love to draw during lectures. When someone's talking to me, I'm really good at zoning them out and just focusing on my drawings. You know, this is my office view every day, which is not terrible. It's been a big lifestyle change, but like, I love the fact that I can, you know, that I can go anywhere. Every morning before work, I rise with the sun to go out and take care of my horse named Ziggy Stardust. And to be honest, I think that is the only thing keeping me sane and balanced while directing on feature. Cut. With the many challenges facing the world of film and television today, this next group of animators are pushing the art form forward and showing that animation is truly poised to be the medium of the future. Hi, I'm Elaine Bogan. I'm a director and a story artist at DreamWorks Animation. I think that animation is a medium that's so wide open and has no limits. Starting with a blank page is both the incredibly daunting and horrifying part of animation, but it's also the amazingly exciting and gratifying part. I lucked out at DreamWorks and ended up working on some really amazing projects. And after years of being a story artist in feature, I transitioned into directing on the Dragons TV series. 
Working on Troll Hunters was honestly like being a kid again because I actually got to go to work and draw things like gnomes and trolls and six-eyed monsters and I was doing it for a living. We are professional weirdos and I never take that for granted. I've been around horses since I was seven or eight years old. Now I'm working on a feature called Spirit Untamed, which has been an incredible first feature to direct. The themes and characters in it are really personal to me, and it's been a really cool experience being able to translate all of that emotion into my work as a storyteller. So I start directing my first big feature film, and then quarantine hits. So now I'm directing a feature film out of my living room. Oh. <laughs> what I think is a huge silver lining of all of this is now that we know animation can be done remotely, the heart side of me can only hope that this will open up a lot more opportunity in the future for people all over the world to tell their stories to. It really doesn't feel like there aren't boundaries in animation to me anymore. There's such a speed of evolution in technology that is just starting to make anything possible. Hey, I'm L.C. Crowley. I'm Brandon Barr. And I'm Greg Yonkaitis. And the three of us are the co-founders and inventors of Treoscope Enhanced Hybrid Animation. Treoscope is a mix of live action performance, CG backgrounds, and 2D stylized graphic novel look. Treoscope is a platform, and it really is only limited by the creator's imagination. The stories that we wanted to tell were rich and deeply nuanced, and that's something we hadn't really seen animation tackle before. So we had an idea for a war story, and we wanted to tell it in a completely new way, and that form didn't exist, so we set out to kind of create the form from the ground up. We showed that to Netflix, and they brought us the Liberator script. Once we read it, we fell in love. We felt like there was a space to bring people into the emotional reality of the characters that we could do in animation that you couldn't do in live action. Animation can be more poetic with visuals in terms that every shot needs to be storyboarded, thought out, designed, executed. I think that makes the whole experience slightly elevated. Animation right now has such a bright future. You know, I really think we're in a Pandora's box moment. A lot of stories that the writers and creators had shelved because they were too expensive to make, they look at Trioscope and they say, okay, this is connecting with the audience and they don't have to be shy with the world building. You know, for me, animation is sort of like that sensation you get when you are in the bright sun and you close your eyes and you see a sort of inverted version of the world around you. You know, that's what animation feels like to me. It's something that you recognize, it's familiar, but your brain is definitely processing it in a, in a different way. Hi, I'm Genevieve Sai, and I'm a supervising character designer at Warner Brothers Animation. I love to laugh and I love making people laugh. Humor was always a big motivator for me. Growing up being funny was like having a superpower. <laughs> I try to bring in some comedy into my characters. My favorite kinds of characters are always whimsical with a little crazy, goofy side to them. That's why I love Animaniacs so much. And when I was a kid, I couldn't wait to come home every day and catch it on TV. And so it's really surreal, you know? I never thought I'd be working on a show that I'd love so much when I was younger. There's a lot of challenges to rebooting Animaniacs. You have to marry these old classic characters to modern times, and you have to really be savvy and on top of it. Animation reboots are unique because unlike live action, the characters don't really age, so it's really up to the artist on how to update these characters. We looked at so many different styles, like for example, the Cuphead game was really popular at the time. So I was trying a lot of uh, rubber hosey, like flusher type cartoons and all these different influences that I like and try to approach it in that way. But I really like the original style and I didn't really want to change it that much. There are things I wanted to put into it, more like expressive faces, more angles. I wanted to give it more of an updated contemporary look. In the end, Spielberg really liked the designs that I came up with and I I think he liked it because it felt the most true to the original legacy characters. There's a lot of ways to make a reboot right. You really have to be connected to it and attached to it. You really 
really wants to stick to the heart of what it was. I'm excited, but a little bit nervous. I hope we're doing the reboot right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brittany Myers. I do character design at Netflix Animation. I think it's really important for animation to break the mold because everyone's kind of itching to see something that, you know, is new and fresh. I was really lucky because my first film credit was on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I worked on crowd characters, so all the people you see in the background, you know, that you aren't really meant to notice, actually. And I learned a ton on that project breaking away from the traditional stuff that actually inspired me to get into animation in the first place. The first animated film that really jumped out to me was definitely Tangled. And so when I just became obsessed, started to look up info on the movie and the art of the movie. I found Glenn Keane's drawings and he did so many drawings for Tangled and I just thought, you know, they were beautiful, so appealing, and that was exactly what I wanted to do. One day, I decided to draw Ariel in my free time, I posted it on my Facebook, and then suddenly I get a ping on my phone and it says, Glenn has commented on your Facebook post. That was a shock, all my friends were messaging me like, oh my God, did you see Glenn commented on your post? And I, you know, I was like, of course I've seen it, I was freaking out. And then the next day I got a, another message from the Glenn's team and they were interested in having me work on a project they were working on. But from there, you know, I started on Over the Moon. I ended up working with Glenn and then also Jin Kim was on the project. And with them, I think it was a perfect kind of collaborative team for Over the Moon is because they had this, you know, great traditional Disney background. And then here I was, this younger artist, and I would kind of push it with shapes and silhouette and kind of, you know, exaggerate proportions. And maybe it'd go a little too far sometimes. You know, we find a balance of what was gonna work for this film. I would definitely say all of us younger artists and the older artists on the project were all learning from each other. So it was just kind of a perfect collaborative environment for everybody. I would say to a young artist, you're almost always your worst critic. You know, as hard as it was for me to muster up the courage to post the artwork, you have to start to believe that you're a good artist. And so I think definitely I would not have had those same opportunities if I hadn't put in the work to put it all out there. Ever since I started at Nickelodeon, I wanted to volunteer, show kids that this is possible and that this stuff can actually be done. Doing art and making things can bring people together when it feels like the world's falling apart. You can go through so many different worlds and you have all the, you can meet all these different characters and it really makes you feel like it's okay to just believe in something. You should never lose that part of you, you know, that the imagination that you had as a kid. I was never the strongest artist in the room with the best drawings, but what I did decide to really rely on was my storytelling. One of my mentors, when I first started in the story trainee program, sat me down and said, look, I don't care what your drawings look like. If you can tell me a good and engaging story, that's all that matters. Now I get to tell my own and pay that back. And now for the grand finale. There's one artist working in animation today who has such a strong voice, such a strong presence. He is an inspiration. I just love all of his work gorgeous, it's intricate, it's immediately recognizable and unique. He's an amazing storyteller. He has such a strong voice and it's so close to him and his own culture. He's a very inspiring guy. He's truly worthy of special recognition. Here's Nickelodeon's president of animation, Ramsey Nido. I feel so lucky that I get to announce this year's recipient for the Creative Impact Award because he's my dear friend. This man has held so many noteworthy titles. Anime, painter, writer, voice actor, collector of obscure t-shirts. All of these experiences have made you who you are, a great leader. But we're not full. We know your most cherished title is husband to wife Sandra and father to Sambuca. You've inspired a generation, maybe two or three. Dang, we're old. Because you are who you are, a powerhouse with gusto, determination, and a heart of gold, which means you naturally create familia where you will. I couldn't be more thrilled to present this award to you today. Jorge Gutierrez, you are a true visionary. But wait, a few others sent some comments. In the words of Jorge Gutierrez, awesome! 
Congratulations, dude, man. I'm so proud of you. You deserve this because through animation, you celebrate our heritage. Thank you. Thank you. Jorge, te abrazo a la distancia. Ojalá pronto nos podamos tomar un mezcal y festejar este premio. Por lo pronto te mando este videíto para reiterarte cuánto te quiero, cuánto te admiro y de verdad cuánto celebro tu labor. Que estés bien. Jorge Gutiérrez, my friend, you one of the top animators in the world. God bless you and congratulations. You're a good dude. From the bottom of my heart, congratulations for him. Hola everyone, I am Jorge Gutierrez, writer, artist, and director. It is with endless gratitude that I accept this honor as this year's recipient of the Creative Impact and Animation Award. A million thank yous to Variety and Nickelodeon. Gracias to all my colleagues, friends, and collaborators from my beloved animation family. I love the idea of making a creative impact. It's been my life's mission as storytellers and artists. Our dream is to broaden the way people look at things. We want to push the voice of authentic characters, create unique and vibrant colorful worlds, and make reality swash and stretch in ways we can only imagine until we manage to give our creations a life of their own. My whole career, my dream has been to make an impact in cultural representation. My work is about celebrating my heritage and using animation to introduce audiences across the globe to the art and cultural traditions of my beloved Mexico. It's also an opportunity to make work that offers viewers of all ages who might not usually see themselves in film and television, but it's possible to occupy these spaces. Like everyone else, we belong in front and behind the camera. Also, when I think about Creative Impact, I think about the great tradition of mentorship. I was very lucky to have various mentors, especially my hero, Guillermo del Toro. And because of this, I try to make an impact by passing the torch to mentor and help others. Thank you, Variety and Nickelodeon, for this great honor. And thank you to these amazing animators for all their incredible work. Keep drawing your life. Keep writing your life. And let's all keep celebrating the creative impact we can make with animation. Gracias. In this special, we talk a lot about our hopes for the future. I have endless hope. We will keep the creative spirit alive. Animation's very powerful. It has the ability to profoundly affect culture. It lets you see stories about other people that you feel in your own heart. You create something that gives you and others joy that I think is worth pursuing. We can use our work to convey a message of hope, of connectivity, and to offer new perspectives on different cultures and walks of life. Animation is huge and it's limitless. As a kid, animation for me was one of the things that really helped me see what could be. It has the ability to show us a better future. Really, the sky's the limit. We are all storytellers of our own lives. If we all share our stories full of heart and soul, the world will only become a better place. Thank you so much to Variety and Nickelodeon. I really, really am grateful. It's a real honor. So freaking cool. It means so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching Nickelodeon and Variety's 10 Animators to Watch, Visions of Tomorrow. See you next year when maybe we can do it in person, perhaps from someplace we haven't even imagined yet.